This meeting is being recorded. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the BBA Journal Club. Uh, I'm Professor Naseem Nakvi, the chair of this forum. Um, if you did not attend our last uh, Journal Club in March, then uh, let me just give you a quick overview of what uh, a Journal Club is. So Journal Clubs have been around for, for centuries and they are very well established in most scientific disciplines. Um, Journal Club highlights important findings from scientific uh, literature, findings which are uh, often buried in, in academic papers. And in fact, the research has shown that it takes on an average around 17 years from um, findings to reach um, the real world uh, uh, applications from lab studies. So we as blockchain practitioners, we must take steps to um, short circuit this delay. So another important um, uh, application of General Club is that it, it teaches and educates industry leaders on how to read and critically appraise important scientific papers, papers that uh, establish uh, emerging consensus and inform best practices. General Club also encourages industry leaders to conduct applied blockchain research and, and it shows them how to do it by the authors themselves. Um, we also want to ensure that uh, the research is being accurately represented and interpreted as well as getting to the right people at the right time. And, and this plays an important uh, factor when it comes to uh, having a broader impact. From author's perspective, it helps to showcase their work to a global audience um, beyond the published literature because they are available, they are presenting the, the, the findings um, in person. So just putting putting their face on the, on the um, uh, research, if you like, uh, it improves their presentation skills and also it is increasingly becoming an essential component of um, alt metrics, also called alternative metrics. This is, these are the measures that um, uh, record the reach, attention, impact of a researcher's work. It is also important for policy makers and senior decision makers to know what cutting edge research is available, which will allow them to make informed decisions. It also helps them to connect with researchers. And I have talked about this before many times, this, this academia, government, enterprise, citizen quadruple helix is, is vitally important in healthy, innovative ecosystems. And lastly, general clubs are increasingly seen as a part of essential curriculum at most universities around the world. They are just not yet a commonplace in the blockchain and crypto space and something that BBA is taking lead on. And we uh, have been approached by universities looking to incorporate these general clubs in their essential uh, curriculum uh, uh, component. So with that, uh, I welcome all of you who have uh, joined us today and welcome to uh, our researchers and the host of today's uh, general club, um, Egli. Egli Papadopoulou from Cyprus. And our uh, speakers are here as well, Florian, uh, Darcy, and Rafal. And I will let Egli uh, take uh, the lead from here. Uh, and thank you very much all for joining. Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you again for uh, joining this session. Um, again, my name is uh, Egli Papadopoulou. I'm leading couple of digital transformation projects in Cyprus in a company called Delecti. And um, Cyprus um, welcomes blockchain, cryptocurrency startups, uh, a lot of um, events, tech events in regards to blockchain development. And um, most importantly, we have 
a couple of companies that work with the technology and expert individuals based in Cyprus. Um, just before we start, uh, we would like to highlight that these sessions are recorded and they are available to watch on YouTube. And for those who register, um, you will receive a CPD certificate and um, the participants um, would be ideal if you have any questions, just ask in the chat. Um, and um, yeah, it's important to highlight that the BBA Journal Club, um, you know, we, we discuss the papers uh, by the academics, uh, we summarize, and it's important that delegates, you know, critically appraise the paper. And today we have uh, three speakers. And we will start with uh, Dr. Darcy. Uh, Dr. Darcy, could you please um, present yourself and your paper? Yes, of course. Um, I don't have permission to start my video, um, but I can share my screen. I don't know if it's meant to be like that, but yes, all good. Um, Darcy, it should work now. I've made your co-host. Perfect. Yes. Hello. There's my face. I am a real person. Um, fantastic. I am going to share my screen. Um, my name is Darcy Allen. I am an economist, a senior research fellow at the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub down in Melbourne, Australia. Um, I apologize for my audio quality and video quality if it's bad. I'm stuck at home with COVID at the moment, so I have only the tech that I have at home. Um, in this paper, so we published this paper back in 2020. Um, so what I wanted to do today was rather than just focus on the paper, that will sort of be the first half of the talk. Um, after that, I want to think about, well, what's happened in those two years and where is the future direction of this research? Um, because as we know, and I think one of the fantastic things that the JBBA does is it turns around publication very quickly and it works on very frontier topics. Um, and I think, it, I think it's good to just sort of um, see how fast the industry is moving even in those, those two years. So this research is about blockchain governance and specifically what we can learn from the economics of corporate governance or how we govern firms to help us design blockchain governance, how we govern blockchains. So in the paper, we define blockchain governance as the process by which stakeholders exercise bargaining powers over the network. Importantly, whenever we're talking about governance or the governance of a blockchain network, we're talking about the rules by which we make decisions and we execute those decisions. It's not about what those decisions are, it's about the processes we create to enable us to make decisions in groups. Whether it's voting, whether it's committees, whether it's some other mechanism, that is what blockchain governance is. It's the way that we make decisions in groups. So why do we even need blockchain governance? Well, blockchain governance is necessary because the world is uncertain. We launch blockchain networks and then those networks must adapt to changing conditions. Maybe they discover some protocol bugs. Maybe there's a hack or an exploit. Maybe they need to spend some of their treasury in a different way that they didn't expect. Or maybe it's simply to adjust some parameters in the system, such as an interest rate or an ecosystem incentive. Blockchain governance is how we make decisions about what to do in these circumstances and how we execute them. Now, there's a lot of different ways to potentially understand blockchain governance, and it depends on what we think blockchains are. If we think blockchains are more like a nation state, then maybe we should pick up political science or political philosophy to try and design blockchain governance. If we think a blockchain is more like a common pool resource, we should pick up our tools and scholarship from what our understanding of common pool resources. Now, our aim in this paper was to say, some of the elements of blockchains look like firms. They often try to make a profit. They have a particular purpose. There's boundaries of a blockchain. And so we tried to use corporate governance theory, what we know from existing corporate governance to design blockchain governance. So this is a theoretical, um, paper. I want to touch on a few things that we talk about in the paper, or a few of our findings. Um, and you can go and read in more detail, of course, the paper is out there. Um, 
one of the key problems in corporate governance, um, and indeed all governance, is defining, well, who are the stakeholders that are being governed and should take part in governance, right? To design governance, we need to know who's taking part in it. Now, if we think about a corporation, the starting point is often, well, the shareholders, right? They're obviously a stakeholder, they've invested, they're the owners. But then as we think about it more and more, we end up with a continuously expanding group of stakeholders. Before you know it, it's the general public is also a stakeholder. Maybe the government is a stakeholder. Maybe the firm is doing something impacting the environment. So environmentalists are stakeholders, right? It keeps on expanding. So the question is, well, who's a stakeholder that should take part in governance to maintain its workability? We can't have every single body taking part in the governance of something. Um, now, if we look to sort of the property rights view or the contract view of corporate governance, those relevant stakeholders are those that have explicit contracts with the firm. So formal written down explicit contracts. And importantly, those with implicit contracts with the firm. Now, implicit contracts are much more amorphous. Um, they are things that aren't actually written down, but they're understood to be true. They're formed around norms and codes of conduct and so on. So let me give you an example. In your employment contract, there is an explicit element that maybe has your wage in it, but there are a lot of implicit contracts that you have with your employer about how you should behave, about how you should interact within your organization. Perhaps there are implicit contracts around how much training you expect to receive or how much mentor, mentoring. Now, those implicit contracts are a really important part of the firm, but they're not written down and codified and formalized. What they're what they are is that they are managed by management within that firm. That's the role of management, not just to deal with explicit contracts, but to make payoffs and negotiate implicit contracts within the firm. Now, blockchain networks are often thought of in a formal sense of the explicit contracts that make up the protocol, but there are also a whole range of implicit contracts around and within these networks. Think about the role of founders. Think about the role of core developers who often don't necessarily have a formal contract in some particular decision, but there is a norm to look to them as an implicit contract for their input. The question then is, well, blockchains don't have managers to manage these implicit contracts. So who manages the implicit contracts in a decentralized network, right? We don't have a manager that is continually negotiating them. In this paper, we argue that, well, there's a few different ways that those contracts are currently um, negotiated. Now, this is just one way to look at blockchain governance. Other ways you might have heard of are, of course, on-chain versus off-chain governance. Um, we distinguish between endogenous governance, which is the governance that is instrumentally determined by the consensus mechanism, um, and this creates a really formal distribution of bargaining power over the network itself. These are the rules at the very heart of a blockchain. They're the rules that determine who can add an additional block, who can decide to upgrade software and so on. They're formal rules at the very beginning of a blockchain network that can either be intentionally or unintentionally designed. The second form of governance is exogenous governance. And those are all the mechanisms built on top of that. These are the governance mechanisms that sit outside that core instrumental consensus process. And it includes all the things around off-chain governance, such as forums and committees and opinion polls, as well as on-chain governance and voting mechanisms. So this is just the way that we split it up in this paper as one way to think about blockchain governance. But we've got a few minutes left. So what I want to talk about is, well, how has my view on blockchain governance shifted over those two years? So myself and my colleagues have been working on blockchain governance for many years now. What we do in the paper is we take an analogizing approach to blockchain governance. We think, okay, if blockchains are like firms, 
then maybe we should start with corporate governance as a starting point. But we can think of that all across a whole range of areas. As I mentioned, we can think about democratic governance, we can think about commons governance and so on. And that is useful, but it's limited, particularly if we think that blockchains stand alone as some sort of institutional form um, in the same sense as a firm, as a category does, or in the same sense a government does. So what's the next step? Well, in the past few years, what we've seen in blockchain governance are really a massive ramp up in blockchain governance. We seen a lot of governance controversies that I'm not going to go into detail. We've seen a lot of governance innovations around aggregation rules like quadratic voting. We've seen more and more composability of blockchain governance. What that means is where we have on-chain tokens for voting, we've seen a lot of escrowing of those tokens, unbundling, buying and selling and so on, leading to interesting dynamics. We've seen a lot more governance tooling. We've seen a lot more governance delegation. It's a very different world to when we wrote this paper two years ago. And I think the next step in blockchain governance is really to move beyond the analogizing approach. It has some use, but there's more um, that needs to be done. And I think we need to embrace the institutional diversity of blockchains. So we need um, to understand that these are polycentric systems. They have many centers of decision-making. They're very nested. Um, increasingly with bridges as well. We're wrapping tokens and taking them across different networks and it's evolving really rapidly. Um, I'm just about out of time here. So what I think we should do now, the future research program should be focused on disentangling this complexity. So understanding that these are really complex networks. They're not just like firms. They're not just like governance, uh, governments. Um, but we should use frameworks like those developed by Eleanor Ostrom um, in the 60s to the 90s to study the commons. We should apply those in this circumstance. So that's what some of my team are doing at the moment. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I hope that's given you some insights into blockchain governance and this paper. Um, and I look forward to, to hearing the other presentations or answering any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Darcy. And um, I have also attached um, your publication with the JBBA here in the chat. And um, yeah, we can now proceed with uh, Florian Knauer. Yes. So, yeah. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Larry. Perfect. Perfect. So you can also see my presentation. Yes. So, yes. Yes, so I'm Florian Knauer and um, I'm from Germany, from the University of Kassel, and I'm also part of the Blockchain Center there. And thank you for the opportunity to um, present our article, What's in it for me? Identifying drivers of blockchain acceptance among German consumers, which was originally published by Professor Mann and me in 2019. And the, I will go very briefly through it, of course. And the major question behind is that, um, yeah, we, as we all know, blockchain technology is exploited in the business area ongoingly and very rapidly. But if you talk about consumers using blockchain technology, it's always, well, not always, but often reduced to cryptocurrency trading and usage. We all know that the amount of wallets and of people trading with cryptocurrencies have raised in the last years, but there are so many more areas of consumer related blockchain of computer design blockchain applications like decentralized search engines, decentralized data storage, social media, online reviews, and most of them stuck in, in their development with a very low amount of users. And the major question is why? That was the motivation of our paper and to answer that question, we've conducted an online survey among 157 German consumers back in July, 2018. So the data are quite old, but I think there are still some key findings that are still valid today and important today. And the scope was then the awareness and the acceptance of blockchain technology and not specific applications, but of course, many of our findings are also valid for marketers, for instance, that promote specific blockchain applications. They're in the survey so was named Future Technologies in Everyday Life uh, to avoid self-selection bias. At least at the beginning, they had to um, 
give answers to different technologies as well to compare the results to the blockchain. Yeah, so let's start with the first question. Um, how many did uh, know the technology, have heard of the technology before? And this were, yeah, 61% at least. So we can say, yeah, it was the lowest percentage of awareness compared to the other technologies we selected, but it's not the problem for acceptance of diffusion. Because if 60% know, 60% yeah, could use it, but they don't do. And if we refer then to the adopter categories of Rogers in his diffusion theory, here we can say that the early adopters are crucial. They um, have partly the intention to use it, but they don't do it. They didn't do it at the moment in 2018. And we also decided to then concentrate on user intention as dependent variable. Yeah, and we've also asked what are associations to the stimulus blockchain, to the keeper blockchain. And as we see, people have connected Bitcoin with it, some core concepts like decentralization, for instance, but also um, some problems like high energy consumption was, consumption was mentioned. Um, as we all know, it's very, um, it's not necessarily the case. It's depending on the consensus mechanism applied, but um, people have that concerns in their mind. Yeah, so the core of our article was a structural equitation model um, aiming at explaining um, the usage, usage intention for blockchain technology. And it had some theoretical, theoretical background from the technology acceptance research area it was in core based on technology acceptance model, which itself is based on theory of planned behavior and was enriched with some extensions of the technology acceptance model, for instance, perceived risk and also tradability and principles knowledge from the diffusion of innovation theory, which is yeah, the perception that there are opportunities to try out a technology and a general knowledge about how a technology works. Yeah, this is the result. And I will not go into it into detail for time reasons, but um, what is interesting is that there are some specific beliefs that explain the usage, usage intention via um, common acceptance variables. That is the felt independence from institution, especially from companies and banks, and perceived improvement of buying conditions like cheaper prices or so on. Yeah, what are now the learnings from this research? Um, well, there are some learnings for researchers. Um, regarding acceptance theory and further um, acceptance research on the blockchain area, for instance, to consider trialability and to consider principles knowledge um, whenever dealing with complex technologies. And we've also found out that um, blockchain technology is perceived as very, very complex. And this leads the way to our practical um, implications that focus on communication issues for your yeah, institutions that want to promote blockchain technology like states but also for companies um, that promote blockchain applications and our first general recommendation is to focus on early adopters that guide um, the early majority and one possible instrument to do so is to use influencer marketing because early adopters are influencers by decision uh, by uh, definition for example, you can reach them via social media or other media. And to emphasize, if you're promoting applications, easy access and usability of these applications to weaken this trialability concerns that impede diffusion and acceptance. And, and that's the most important point I want to um, state in the end, you need to translate these technology features into benefits for consumers, because most of them don't want to or can't understand technological features or differences in different applications. They don't have the motivation or the ability to do so. We do translate it into things like, is there a difference in independence regarding states or companies if I use that application? Or can I improve my transaction conditions by um, using these uh, applications. Yeah, this is my core statement at the end. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to discuss with you later on. 
Thank you very much, Florian. Um, okay, we can proceed with the um, with Dr. Rafal. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Presentation. Okay, this is my presentation. Yes, thank you. All right, okay. So, um, I think it was two years ago before the COVID pandemic um, was um, yeah, changing everything in our world. I was, um, I was having a possibility to write an article about smart contracts. Uh, so, uh, it was a very nice opportunity to show uh, one of the most important things that smart contracts are not always contracts. They have sometimes some kind of uh, legal implications, but mostly we should remember that there is it is a code. Um, so it's some kind of um, programming language used to make a uh, possibility to build a self-execution. And this is the most important thing that I will try to show my um, presentation. I'm going to show my presentation, but also I was uh, trying to show in my paper. Uh, we were um, working after um, this uh, paper with the Professor Sosti in Poland. Unfortunately, in Poland, there were uh, not so many changes, but for example, in the United Kingdom, we see that uh, the, there is going to be some kind of legislation. For example, now we see that there is a proposal for. Uh, definition for distributed network technology. Of course, there's a lot of also some kind of um, movements. Of all, your sound is uh, the sound is not very good. Your your sound is there is a lot of scratching kind of sounds noise coming from the background. Okay, I don't know why. Give me one moment. I will try to change something. Thank you. Okay, do you hear me? Yeah, it's better. Yeah, that's that's better. Thank you. Moment, I don't hear you. Uh, what happened? Hello, one, two, three. Hello, hello, hello. No. Yes. Hello. Oh, do, do you hear me? Yeah. This is better now. Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Yes. Okay. I don't know what's go what's going on. Okay. So uh, once again, um, there are some changes that we see in the um, next European legislation, uh, but also we see a lot of changes in uh, legal tech. We see that lawyers are very interested in new technologies, especially in smart contracts. They see some kind of opportunities there. Uh, Legal tech is a very interesting movement. Uh, I'd say that in the United Kingdom, there is also something called uh, law tech. So the lawyers are trying to use new technologies for their own uh, purpose. And the most important thing is that um, it's also a very interesting thing to uh, try uh, in um, dealing with artificial intelligence because we know that it's a code. It's not some kind of legislation. So why not to use the code to control artificial intelligence, especially that it's better. And we also know that some countries are experimenting, especially making some experiments, thinking about seeing all as a rule. 
so it's a very good, very good opportunity to, to try with smart contracts and uh, such things, especially that we know that uh, Ethereum was uh, once described as possible way to uh, develop the Kubernetes, law, so use the Kubernetes graphic for uh, making the, the frameworks uh, for uh, some Kubernetes other than legislation. So it's very interesting to use the smart contract, especially that we see also that, uh, as I said, the lawyers are trying to experiment after my paper. I was making some other investigation and I said that there are projects, for example, to make a dispute resolution with the smart contracts. And this is a very interesting thing because it could give us some very interesting outcomes and change our thinking in a way when we see some uh, disputes and how to resolve them. And maybe this is also a very good uh, way to use the code as a law and also smart. Uh, complex. Uh, this um, is also interesting because there is something called Pleros. It's uh, some kind of code that was using um, blockchain and it was giving, winning some prizes um, in the United European mm -hmm. for this idea. So I hope this is the future also for our course to use smart contracts to use blockchain. And this is the future for us lawyers to think about this um tools uh, connected with blockchain to use it. Uh, why? Because they are dealing with the data, because they are giving it possible to, to, to use this data. Uh, and as we know, the tool is also the place where we are dealing with uh, data and using smart contracts and using blockchain to use also anything um and not, uh, anything impossible because we also serve uh, that the Chinese folks are trying to use um, such technologies, so it will be uh, the future. And uh, this, uh, this is all I have for today. Uh, thank you for invitation. Uh, thank you for giving me a possibility to say something about my uh, research um, interest. And sorry for my voice. I do not know what's happening. I'm now uh, on the trip, so I'm doing my best. Uh, with uh, communication things, there were some troubles with internet. So sorry for this. And uh, if you have any questions, you can always wrote me some message on LinkedIn or email. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Rafael. So you can reach out to Rafael on LinkedIn. If you have any questions? So there's a question <clears throat> from Carlos. Rafal, if you are still here, uh, very interesting topic being presented. We all know legislators lag behind innovators. Yes, I agree with techno neutral legal frameworks in order to mitigate loss of relevance over time. How would one make a DLT techno neutral when it is so techno specific? Mm, interesting. Perhaps focus on applying constraints in the architecture looking forward to finding cues. So I, I guess the, the question is interesting. How, so techno neutral legal frameworks, how can we make blockchain techno neutral when it is so techno specific? Rafal, any thoughts? Thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, this is uh, very interesting. And, um... Yeah, there is a lot of um, problems with making legislation for technology, uh, not only for blockchain. We see this also on the artificial intelligence field. Uh, because when we are saying about artificial intelligence, uh, it does mean uh, it does mean a lot of things. Um, it's very hard to make, uh, for example, one legislation that will be uh, universal. Uh, we see that we have now I Act, and the legislator was trying to really make it uh, neutral, really make it very universal, but also there is a question because this is very ma a major, I think, um, idea to, to build. That's why I'm uh, um, trying to, to, to show you how it works. Um, that it will stop for, um, it will be um, very unfortunately um, uh, some kind of uh, barrier for innovators. Uh, it will stop 
um, the, the, the researchers and the business to develop artificial intelligence. And this is the same problem with DLT uh, that whatever we are going to prepare, it could be a blocker and not uh, something that will bring us possibility to, to make new developments, to make new um, fields to, to, to create a very interesting solution. And to see that are possible to make new, um, new solutions. The only thing is how to make it possible and, of course, uh, how to give also the benefits by making the invitation for society. Yes. So this is very hard, but we are discussing on a, a you know, um, a lawyer's, um, lawyer's community, uh, all these things. So I hope we'll uh, you know, make some uh, interesting outcomes also to, to protect the market, protect the business, and also the benefits of this. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Rafa. I think there was a question for, um for Darcy and he has answered it in the chat, but uh, just for our audience, um, the question was about DAO governance. So some DAOs are not mitigating hostile takeovers. So uh, a, a individual or a small number of individuals taking uh, control of the DAO, even though we are saying that they are decentralized autonomous organizations. So leaving the projects very vulnerable. So is that something Darcy that we can do something about that? Um, I think DAO governance, of course, DAOs haven't been around for too long at all. Um, it's still extremely experimental, but I think it's evolved an enormous amount even in the last few years. Um, and we've gone through phases, right? Some of those phases were focused on, well, the solution to this problem is to give every token holder a vote and we decentralize to the maximum amount we can um, and that will somehow solve the problem. And over time, what's happened is DAOs have matured because what they've started to do is they've started to delegate some of their governance powers to smaller bodies within the DAO. So these are called different names based on different protocols. Some are called pods, some are called working groups and committees and whatever you want to call them. Um, what this is, is that instead of opening everything up to a token holder vote, we can use a system which is kind of like representative democracy where the token holders vote to elect a smaller committee who might control a multi-sig who um, can make some decisions. Now, that power can be taken back by token holders at the end, hopefully. Um, but what this is, is that instead of thinking about DAOs as just this one single attack vector, which is very clear how many tokens you need to get to undertake a governance attack, we're making it into a more polycentric system with lots of centers of decision making, which looks really complex, but there are benefits in terms of robustness and resilience of the governance of DAOs. Um, uh, one of the things that I wrote in the, in the chat was that I think this is going to be a particular challenge as we go through crypto winter, because as we see token prices drop, um, it's easier to attack particular blockchains um, and DAOs people lose interest as well. The community loses interest. So it's easier to run an attack. Um, but optimistically, we're seeing a lot of work in DAO tooling, which is helping us to create more robust governance structures around DAOs. Um, I, I'll leave it there. I can keep talking about this topic for a long time, um, but someone else might want to might want to jump in. Thank you. Yes, Darcy, that's, that's very clear. Um, just a, a few quick a few quick uh, replies to the questions in, in, in the chat. So uh, are these sessions live? No, the sessions are not live, but the recording it, it will be made available on our YouTube channel uh, uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks time. And all of those who attended today will receive CPD certificates, um, individualized CPD certificates with your name on them. Uh, and what was the other question? Where is the YouTube channel? So YouTube channel is if you just go to YouTube and type the JBBA, uh, we have shared the link. Um, where are the papers? So the papers, as Darcy said, they are already in public domain. They are open access papers. There is no um, cost to read, download, share these papers. JBBA is an open access journal. So all three papers, uh, Darcy's corporate governance paper and the uh, Florian's paper and Rafal Prabhuki's smarter contract. They're all published in the JBBA. Uh, there is a question for Florian. 
any plans to do a follow up study on dlt perception among german consumers florian yeah yeah so we've also conducted a second one but among decision makers in germany in yeah mainly small size companies and what was interesting is that their perception of technology is very consumer driven or many of them obviously didn't get any input from their um industry or wherever um to have an, an opinion that is different from that of consumer that was very very interesting um but we don't have concrete plans to make a new study on that or to make like time analysis and and, and have a look at uh, what what has has changed in the last few years but it's very interesting so maybe we're going to do that so now i have a different a kind of different research focus uh, I, we i'm researching about online reviews and how they can be tempered and how to avoid that by blockchain technology that's why i'm focusing at the moment on but maybe we can also do some other acceptance research again so i'm um, so if anybody um wants to collaborate or something like that i'm very happy about that um and another, i have another question if i can to this um accountability or um, corporate governance to dao um issue because i was wondering because the whole corporate governance idea is about accountability right so that there is somebody responsible for it and how how need the laws to, yeah so so i'm i'm it's kind of counterintuitive in my opinion to decentralization but if, as i got you that's the gap to close you know and so my question is are the states the large states like like say china usa however willing to really give decentralized organization a chance because they kind of lose control um and regulation because there is not this accountability anymore and how might this um the whole idea of corporate governance need to be changed to fit for these centralized organizations that would be my very interesting question because I, i think dealing about corporate governance is a very very interesting or maybe the most important thing if you want to change that or make them like um anywhere yeah mm. yeah um Sorry, do you want me to jump in? Is that all good? Um, so that is an excellent question, and I think it's a really, really hard one to answer. Um, you're exactly right that the purpose of corporate governance is accountability. Um, in terms of um, you have a principal agent problem, you, we've split up the decision making power from the owners and investors, so you create this corporate governance structure. Um, specifically to overcome opportunism in that process so that the the insiders the um the managers can't you know run away with the cash or do things in their own interests um while giving them the freedom to make make decisions that's very different to political governance right political governance is largely about legitimacy um how do you get um a like the sovereign power how do you make a government legitimate through representative yeah. democracy or whatever it is they have different purposes um and over time my view has kind of evolved since this paper i'm not convinced that corporate governance is necessarily the way to um view blockchains in their entirety as i was trying to get at at the end and that is in part because in the past 2 years we've seen the boundaries of blockchains and DAOs and so on become more and more porous so as we have way more bridges as we have way more governance rights that are put into particular protocols and wrapped and bundled unbundled and lots of briberies in the curve wars and so on it makes it less clear to me that the standard corporate governance view of insiders need outsiders need to be protected by insiders fits um in this circumstance um on the regulation point um and i'll answer this in part in relation to the other question about regulation and technology neutrality um it's really hard to regulate crypto blockchains because they are a very different type of technology compared to most technologies that we're used to so most technologies that are invented are industrial technologies they make us things we do things physically faster and better and cheaper as we know blockchains are a governance technology they're an institutional technology um our entire regulatory system is built assuming that we don't really have innovations in institutional technologies why that is is because there are very rare innovations in institutional technologies but 
we look out at corporations and we know how to regulate corporations, right? We go to the director and we knock on their door and they say, we say, you don't do that or we are going to take you to court, basically. We know how to regulate firms. We know how to regulate markets as well through competition policy and all these other consumer protections. There's this new institution that comes along and it doesn't fit within those two boxes. This isn't mm. just adding a tiny thing into the Corporations Act and everything's all good because the Corporations Act in most countries assumes that there is a director that you can go and knock on the door of and <laughs> solve the problem. And this is kind of what you're getting at. I think that um, governments aren't particularly going to want to give up that power if there isn't that, that accountability. I think we're seeing a lot, of, a lot of advances in crypto regulation across the world, um, but it's going to be a pretty uneasy process. Yeah. Sorry, so, that's a reasonably long answer. But. Yeah, no, but I want to add a lot because I've talked about this survey we've conducted among um, decision makers and one of their largest concerns was that they don't have legal certainty. That they, uh, that they are kind of, they've, they've discussed to introduce in many, many situations blockchain solutions, but um, at least if they do some private thing, they can, they can manage that kind of. But if they, if you're talking about more like um, not private blockchains or really give up power, then they have that legal uncertainty, and that's different, difficult to to deal with. Yeah, because pu public blockchains are an institution that sits between other institutions, not within yeah. them per se, and that makes that accountability. It just doesn't fit within our mental or legal models of yeah. of who is accountable. But that's the whole benefit of the technology in many ways. Um, but it also means that a lot of regulatory applications are really hard to apply slash maybe they don't even make sense in this context, right? So you have, um, well, in Australia at least, we have regulations around managed investment schemes. So you have, there's, if there's a manager that's there's pooling of assets to, for some joint gain, managed investment in schemes as a financial product, um, we regulate them because we're worried about the manager doing things in their own interest against the people who pulled the money. Um, you look at a lot of crypto projects and they fit this um, idea of a managed investment scheme, but there's no manager to worry about. So A, how do you enforce the rules? And B, do we care if there's no manager doing it and it's actually all of us deciding to do it together um, in a, for instance, an investment DAO or something like that? Um, it's complicated. <laughs> there's a lot of work <laughs> to be done. <laughs> Thanks, Darcy. Um, we have one quick comment from Sujata saying extremely informative session. Thank you very much, Sujata. I think we have just, we take one last question. Um, uh, well, two questions. Martin Guzman saying, how about doing the DLT perception study for not just Germany? Uh, yes, why not? Go ahead, do that. If you are listening to this, you're a researcher, practitioner. Um, uh, Florian's study was around German consumers, but if you want to do it, uh, for Australia, Singapore, Canada, wherever, uh, DLT perception among consumers, or maybe somebody's already done it. Uh, yeah, go ahead. This is the whole point of having you know these uh, general club sessions. So one last question, which I think is kind of around governance, also law. Uh, I don't know if Florian is still here. And the question is, DAO must be registered somewhere as a LLC. Buy the LLC, you buy the DAO. And then you have these, a group of people making decisions about all kinds of DAO governance structures. Uh, so the purpose, it defeats the purpose of decentralization of decision-making power. So uh, I would quickly take uh, all three speakers, buying the DAO as an LLC, and then you have more control over decisions. Uh, starting with Florian. Florian? Well, it's kind of, so I'm, I'm not an expert about that, honestly, but um, it's like, I don't know if you always want to put the, the, the new DAO idea, um, as Darcy has already emphasized, into yeah, the old structures, you kind of have some some adjustment to do. That's, that's, that's the thing. And there's still lots of to do. And then we're talking about international things. That makes it also even more complicated, I think. Yeah, so. Exactly. Flor uh, Rafal, any thoughts? Are you here? Yeah. From, from legal perspective? 
for good of the I I want to um, I want to say that yeah, there are some movements, there are also some ideas to recognize DAO as some kind of legal entity. Uh, this is possible way. The question is, do we need to do this? And of course, there always are some arguments for to do this. And also against so the question is, uh, if we create the DAO and it was space uh, to be code as law, as a law, do we need to, to recognize this as some kind of legal entity? Thank you. Darcy, any final thoughts? Um, it's, it's a tough question. Um, so when DAOs are deciding to get registered, for instance, as an LLC, and LLC, my understanding, not as a lawyer, is interesting in the United States because you don't need a director attached to it. And that's why people are doing it as an LLC, and not a corporation, um, which doesn't exist in countries like Australia and the Senate kind of working through that at the moment. Um, that's because the DAO wants to, um, in general, the DAO wants to be a legal entity so that it can engage in contact contracts within that territorial jurisdiction. Um, so it's trying to integrate within the existing rules so that it can use the existing legal frameworks. Um, I'm not sure how this will play out over time. I certainly think it's the case that um, a lot of DAOs will never register anywhere and they will decide to stay as um, decentralized organizations um, because in my mind, one of the main reasons why we've seen DAOs and DeFi and NFTs over the last two years is precisely because of regulatory arbitrage. These things came about because they were able to happen outside of the scope of regulatory systems. Um, and I'm not sure how they come back and integrate very, very easily. Um, so that's that's not really an answer to the question, but I think it's 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 not clear how it plays out from here. It might be a small blip in history where we saw DAOs registering within territorial jurisdictions and that will go away over time, but we'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Agli, I think we can conclude the session. Yes, I agree. Um, okay, so um, the video will be uploaded on YouTube. For anyone who wishes to contact the speakers, um, I believe you're all on LinkedIn. Have any questions? And um, yeah, we'll see you on the next um, uh, next month on the JBBA forum. And thank you everyone for joining. It was a pleasure meeting you. I have a question maybe. Is it possible, is the same link? Can we attend to the other sessions as well? Or um, is that uh, possible? Yes, yes. So if is you have registered oh. for, so it's the same link because right. these, these are webinars. So you can register for all future sessions in one click all right. till the end of the year. So the, the forum, the journal club is a part of the BBA forum. And obviously forums and other activities going on. You can watch on YouTube, uh, our members presenting and industry sessions and interviews and panel discussions and all that. So it's, it's once a month. And then um, we the journal club is a part of the BBA forum. Uh, so yeah, they, they, they are happening uh, every month, uh, usually on a Sunday. Uh, at 5 p.m. UK time, but this time we decided to do it 11 a.m. to have uh, our uh, speakers from Australia who can join because if you start at 5 p.m. it would be like midnight <laughs> Australia, Im almost impossible to from from Australia to join at 5 p.m. UK, I believe. So yeah, um, so thank you, yeah, thank you very much uh, everybody who attended, and we'll see you uh, uh, next month. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. bye.